every year I would uh, take a vacation for about seven to ten days with all the family. And uh, uh, my wife would say, okay, you don't owe me anything, but you owe me a seven to ten day vacation with all the kids every year through the year. You're going to pay for everything, plane tickets, cars, rental, motel, food, whatever it is. So I finished up every year at Santa Claus. I'm, I'm paying for everything. But during that time, uh, I said, one day you owe me four hours. And so we're going to get together four hours, and then uh, I'm going to give you three tests. I'm going to give you an academic skills test. Uh, uh, they were just various tests I ordered from, ta- from Dallas, Texas. I'm trying to help you find out what you're good at. Because you're going to make a living at what you're good at. And I don't want to be supporting you when you're 40. I want you to move out of my house. I like a big family. I always liked a big family. But I want you to leave. And uh, you stay gone. I'll see you when we go to heaven. Uh, we're going to live forever in heaven somewhere doing something. So it doesn't bother me. And so uh, take those four hours. And so I'll try to make sure do you know who you are and what you're good at. And so at the end of those four hours, I'd make him take a piece of paper and write down, I want one sentence, one sentence on this piece of paper you're going to write down. Tell me what you're good at, because that's what somebody's going to pay you for. They're not going to pay you for what you're not good at. So we do that every year and every year. So eventually we got to the point where they're getting, they're marrying off, and so there's other families involved. So you know, I, I hoarded it all for a while because I'm paying for everything. No, nobody's going to miss my vacation because I'm the sugar daddy stuck upside down their chimney. Well, eventually they start marrying off. They got, well, Dad, we got to go to my wife's family. We got to go to my husband's family. I said, well, I think we've hit the end of the road on this thing. So you just need to go, and we're going to stop this. It's been a great run. I think we did it for almost, I don't know, 16, 17 years. It's, it's been a good run, but that's it. And so uh, a couple of years went by. I said, well, Dad, we need to, we kind of miss that, you know, focus on the future thing for the next year. I said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll get on the phone. We'll get a phone call thing going. We can do it in five minutes. Five minutes, we'll all be conference called, and uh, y'all get on the phone, and I'll lead you through what the next year is and how you're going to lay it out. And so we would do that. So the greatest one I ever did is one I'm going to share with you this morning. I came up with six things. I like six, uh, six days a week, and then seven day you rest. So uh, I was a, a multimillionaire guy down in Florida one time. Uh, he had a patent on a big crane. And uh, he built this thing. Now, he's an engineer, graduated from the University of Florida, played for Florida football. But he's a very smart engineer, and he got a patent on a big crane that would drill a hole up and down the coast where they build big hotels. Well, you can't build a hotel on the sand. You have to drill down, you hit bedrock. So he invented this crane that would drill down, hit bedrock, go into the bedrock, and then as the drill came back out of the bedrock, it was hollow on the inside. He would pump concrete down the middle, and it would fill up with concrete as he brought the thing out, a two-in-one process. We got a patent on it. Everybody wanted to buy the thing. So it became a multi multi millionaire. And so uh, we were sitting eating dinner one time, and uh, he'd always take us to this great seafood restaurant on the coast. You couldn't get in unless you remember. And so we're there at this magnificent five-star restaurant. And I said, well, yes, that's the guy, what he does for a living. And they were asking questions. And I said, well, uh, when do you take off every week? He said, Sunday. Yeah, no, Sunday, but when do you take a day off? Said, Sunday's my day off. He said, you don't take Saturday? No, no, uh, the Bible says you work six days and rest one. And uh, and they kept asking questions. My, my kids are in high school, the oldest from down to elementary. <laughs> he said, I realize that people who work six days a week make more money than people who work five days a week. And it was just a real quiet conversation all of a sudden. He said, I looked out the window, and we were right on the water. Beautiful big old sailboat. See that big sailboat out there? He said, that's mine. That's mine. I own that. He said, we just got back from French Morocco for two weeks. We've been in French Morocco for two weeks on vacation. I make good money at what I do, but I work six days a week, not five. Well, that's foreign to most Americans. We believe in that 40-hour work week and 41 hours. That's a sin. There's just something wrong with that. And so there's seasons in the socks life where sometimes you have to put an extra time. You have to do extra things. So um, people always ask me about the last days because I'm a preacher. Well, I was an engineer for years before I became a preacher. And so I became a preacher. So big family. Uh, I've shared every year. My dad's got 12 brothers and sisters, so did my father-in-law. And so uh, 
So they, I'm the only preacher in the bunch, and I'm Pentecostal. So anytime anything bad happens, the phone lights up. Brother Joe, what do you think's going on? And I remember we shared a couple years ago when the, the, the Wuhan China thing happened. So, well, somebody in Wuhan let them out of a jar, and they closed Disney World, you know. But they're going to open it back up. It'll, it'll be fine. Because I read my Bible, and the Bible says in the last days, uh, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, a heady, high-minded, truth breakers, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. It's a long list of nasty. In the book of Luke, Jesus is talking about the last days. They asked Jesus about the last days. He said, well, what's it going to be like? So it will be like it was in the days of Noah. People eating, drinking, marrying, giving marriage, buying, selling, building, and planting. It will be business as usual to the day I come to get the body of Christ. Uh, in other words, the day Jesus comes to get the church, Walmart will be packed. People will be in the movie theater. People will be at Disney. People will be at the lake. People will be on vacation. When Jesus comes back, most everybody's not going to be looking for him, which is why we're reminded to keep our eyes open, you know, and our ears open, to be looking for the return of the Lord. Now, we need to go to work and do our job and pitch some horseshoes, have some fun, laugh, uh, pop some popcorn, but we need to also keep in mind that it's getting close. And so this is a great time to be alive. So people would grill me, especially the family, brother, what do you think is going on? I said, well, it's a great day to be alive. I said, there's never been a better day to get married than now. There's never been a better day to get married. There's never been a better day to have children than now. This is the last days when God's Spirit's poured out without measure. And so when I'm going through this process, they'll just get kind of quiet. And I said, well, because if you're not in church, if you're not, if you're not born again, if you're not reading your Bible, you're lost as a goose in a snowstorm, and this doesn't make any sense to you. So I'm going to read a short passage to you. It's a real short sermon. We're going to go to lunch early. Because I can do this. Uh, I'm going to read a passage from Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I like this translation. Philippians 4, verse 4 says this. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say again, rejoice. Well, I thought you were going to talk about some na nasty stuff. Because yeah, there's, there's nasty times. Satan is the legal, temporary God of this planet. That's why prisons are full, and orphanages are full, and hospitals are full. The devil kills, steals, and destroys. But we're in the last days. We've been taken out of his kingdom, placed in the kingdom of God's dear son. We got it made. This is always be full of joy, always be full of joy. I say again, rejoice. That everyone that sees you, that you can, uh, everyone that, that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember the Lord's coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Then pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Now, I've highlighted that in my Bible. God goes where he gets thanked. God doesn't go where he gets cussed or cursed. God likes praise. God inhabits praise. You go to heaven, there are four angels around the throne with six wings, with two wings that cover their eyes, two wings that cover their feet, with two wings they fly. They got eyeballs never side of their head. All they do is cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They followed that back and forth across the throne. And I've said every time I've come here, you go to heaven, you're going to see these angels. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And you can ask God, God, what are these guys doing? Well, son, they're praising me. Shut your mouth up. Listen to it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And then the angel in that corner, he volleys it back. Then the angel, he volleys it back. And all they do for eternity all they do for eternity is praise God. Because the Bible says God inhabits praise. God goes where he gets thanked. God doesn't go. He doesn't go where he gets cussed. And so when hell lands, and hell's coming to everybody. Everybody goes through tests and trials. Tests and trials come to everybody. You know, just because I'm born again in spirit field doesn't mean I'm immune to the tests and trials of life. But God's already provided a way out. So every time something bad happens, what are you looking for? I'm looking for the way out. God's provided the way out of this mess. There's a solution. There's some wisdom. There's a counsel. There's somebody that can help me. But I'm just not going to sit here and get pounded on. I need to start looking for the way out. I'm in, I'm in a way out mode. So my kids became adults. Now they're dropping babies like rainwater out of heaven. And now life's not just fun anymore. <laughs> life's expensive. They're trying to pay bills and you know keep the toilet flushing and you know, kids need braces on their teeth and uh, money special education. Like, what do you, 
it's expensive. Well, yes, darling, I, I thought you saw that mom and I all these years. Well, we were to take care of you and educate you and provide you with a good living and straight teeth, and that's what we did. That was our job. Well, now that's your job. That, that's not my job. That, that's, that, that's your job. Oh, that was deep. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, mm. what is honorable, what is right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me, everything you have heard from me and saw me doing, that the God of peace will be with you always. Well, I want the God of peace with me all the time. Why? Because there's stuff going on. He said, well, do you ever watch the news? I watch it 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes every day I watch the news. And so uh, so this this is the this thing all my kids got this year. You can go to my website and download this for free. It's just six short points. And it's like I had a five-minute conversation. Says, Guys, you need to remember these six things. Just six things. I got one scripture each one. Six things you need to do this year. Number one. You're going to be spending the rest of your life constantly plant, pushing yourself out of something. I, I know so many Christians that got born again said, man, I, I stopped drinking, I stopped cussing, but I still lose my temper, and then I'd still say something I shouldn't have said. And, and it's like, well, that's because you're growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. You're not there. You'll be still be on your way when Jesus comes to get you. You'll never fully grow, but you're growing. It's a process. You know, it's not an instant thing. Because I had so many people, well, I didn't really get saved. Sure you did. No, I didn't. I've sinned again. I've cussed three times today. Well, stop it. <laughs> you know, just stop it. Get you some new words. You know, find you a new dictionary. And so here's the scripture, Romans 12, 2. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Because the rest of your life, you're going to be getting new thoughts. Your whole life, you'll be getting new thoughts. You're going to think something tomorrow you never thought before. You're going to think something this week you've never had to think before because you're going to encounter something you've never encountered before. Because the devil, he's crafty. But whatever he plans, God's already got a way out, but you've got to look for it. So there's a way out. What are we going to do? Well, I've got to change how I think. How am I going to do that? I need to change what I read, what I watch, what I listen to, what I sing, what I say. I've got to reprogram my mind. Think on these things. I've got to change what I think about. Number two, uh, this is uh, the story from Sodom and Gomorrah about Lot and his wife when the fire and brimstone was rained down. As they're leaving the city, danger had warned them, don't look back. Don't look back. Well, Lot's wife looked back. She turned into a pillar of salt. It's like, well, what does that mean? Well, God, when you come out of something, don't look back at it. Uh, I remember guys I hung out with when I was uh, an idiot doofus. I got born again when I was uh, 21, legitimately. got born again when I was 12, but really born again spiritual when I was 21. People that knew me said, what happened to you? Well, I got a new mind. I got a new way of living. I, I'm going to church now. I'm reading my Bible. I pray every day. I'm still the same person. I'm still making mistakes. The Bible says the righteous fall seven times a day, but they get back up. I still fall down, scoop dirt in my lower lips, still got to get up spit it out, but I'm growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. I'm going somewhere. And so First Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this. Now listen, you start looking back, you're going to impede your progress. You're going you're gonna to stop growing. I don't look back. People can remind you, did you used to do this? Yeah, but I don't do that anymore. Didn't you used to cuss the blue streak? Yeah, I was real good at it. I don't do that anymore. And so I don't think about it. Because what the devil wants to do is make you feel guilty about what you did when you did it, who you did it with, why you did it. No, my past is under the blood. You go to heaven, there are books in heaven. You go to heaven, there's a book that says Joe McGee on the end of it. All the days of my life were written in that book before my mother met my father. My life is recorded in a book in heaven. God saw me coming, saw everything I would do, everywhere I'd go, everything I said. It's recorded in the book. But the day I got born again in spirit filled, the Bible says whenever I repent of any of that sin, that book gets washed by the blood of Jesus. So when you get to heaven, you're going to see the book with Joe McGill on the end of it. When you open it up, the pages are soaked in blood. You can't read them. Why? Well, I repented. 
I'm washed clean. Humans can remember it. God does not. God says, no, I will remember your sin no more. I'm clean. And so uh, I used to do a thing with the high school kids about, uh, I was in a courtroom, there's God the Father, he's the judge, and then Jesus is my attorney standing next to him. Now I'm down here on the floor, and I got the devil, the accuser, the brother that accused me of things I did and <laughs> thought and everything. And so he accuses me, and then I, talk, I look at my attorney and say, well, Jesus, and Jesus looks to the Father and says, no, that's covered. No, he's innocent of that. And then the devil accuses me of something else. I looked at Jesus. He whispered something to the Father. I said, no, that's covered. Because next to the throne of heaven is the mercy seat. It's where the blood is. Jesus had to take his blood to heaven when he let Mary and Martha, when he came out of the grave. I have God, I've sinned to my Father, your Father, my God, your God. What do you you got to take the blood to the mercy seat. It's still fresh. Whenever God looks at me, he looks at the mercy seat. That's the blood of the Son shed for me. I'm redeemed. I've been bought with the blood of the Lamb. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. All I have to do is repent every day and forgive every day. I'm in a constant repenting, forgiving mode. You perfect? No, but I know that. I still have flesh. This body's damned. It's going back to dust. One day I get a new body. But when I got it, it's a mess. I got to keep my body under. How do you do? Well, if I don't keep it under, I just repent real quick. And it gets washed clean again by the blood. So the devil can hold nothing on me. Do you used to do that? I don't do that anymore. Did you ever say that? Mm -hmm, I don't say that anymore. Did you sin? Oh, yeah, I was sinning on a full-time basis. I was a full-time sinner. I sinned seven days a week, 24 hours a day if I was awake, but I don't anymore. I'm now born again. I'm washed clean by the blood of Jesus. I'm a new creature in Christ. And so you have to learn who you are, or you're going to stay whipped all your life, and you're going to feel bad, and you're going to feel guilty, and faith doesn't work where guilt is. I need my faith to work, and I need to work good. So, number three, I like this one. I have no past. That's what I've been saying. I'm clean. Mark eleven twenty five. Mark eleven twenty five. But when you are praying, forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against. Well, I used to think about that. Anybody holding any grudges? My pastor, I got a great pastor down in Florida, and we go every Wednesday night, and he, he's been around a long time, and, and he'll say, you know, you got anything you did wrong today? I might, I might have. You still thinking about it? Probably. They deserve it, though. They deserve what they got. They no good north them, but south down, thumb sucking. They deserve it. Nobody deserves nothing. The Bible says, pray for those who abuse you, misuse you, saw manner of evil against you. I'm not to judge them. I'm to pray for my enemies. And that's a hard thing to say. God bless them. Well, that wasn't much of a prayer. Well, God bless them good. Bless them real good, in Jesus' name. I plead the blood and bless them good. Any way you can, God bless them. And I start praying different for people that I never did like before. And I had family members, just meaner than snot. And uh, I would have some nasty words about it. And I thought, well, I don't say anything bad, but I know what I think. Well, it's just as bad when you think it. So the angel writes that down, too. You'll give an account of every idle deed and every idle thought. I was like, no, I can't think anything bad about anybody. I love everybody. Pray for everybody. Uh, I'm a die-in-the-wool Republican. Been for a long time. And uh, voted for a lot of Democrats. That's all I got to say about that. But my president, I pray for my president every day. And my family has been astonished because we go to sometimes these big family things. And so somebody going to pray, and I pray short prayers. I don't pray long prayers. It's most we're eating. I'm just praying over the food. I'm not praying over anything. And so I pray for my president every day. So God, take blindness from his mind, lighten eyes of understanding, send labors across his path, talk to me, go to sleep when he gets up. So I pray for I didn't vote for him. I'd never vote for him. I'll never vote for him. But I pray for him every day. And I pray sincerely and earnestly because that's what I'm commanded to. God says, pray for those in authority that you might lead a quiet and peaceful life. My job on earth is to pray for everybody in authority. I used to say Daniel had to pray for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had killed his parents, killed his pet goat, burnt down his house, and made him a slave. And got the need to pray for Nebuchadnezzar. I pray she bear rip his head off, spit down his throat. No, wrong prayer. Wrong prayer. I need you to pray that he has a peaceful day. Because if he has a peaceful day, you're going to have a peaceful day. So Daniel got arrested for praying three times a day. Well, 
What's he praying? Well, the Bible already told us what he's praying. He's praying, he's praying for Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar arrested him. And so I imagine when he got arrested, well, you ignorant heathen king, who do you think I'm praying for? But he didn't open his mouth. And because he didn't open his mouth, the lions did not open their mouth. And he came out the next day, and all the people that accused him, they got thrown in, and the lions got their appetite back. They made a great movie about it just in the Bible. He says, First, forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive you your sins because they're tied together. I won't be forgiven what I don't forgive. But I will be forgiven what I do forgive, and I forgive everything. And I mean that. As I've lived long enough, I realize, whoa, I'm not holding anything against anybody. God bless them. Help them any way you can. Send labors across their path. Number four, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Uh, you're believing God for something, you don't see it. I remember one time, I share this every year, I needed a pickup truck. We were coming out of Bible school. Uh, we got three minimum wage jobs between my wife and I, between the two of us. I'd been an engineer, lived in a nice home, drove nice cars. I got nothing now. Man, we're just barely making it. So three years in Bible school, so working these minimum wage jobs. So I needed a truck. So I went down to the Chevrolet dealership, and I saw what I wanted, just a, a single cab, brand-new pickup truck, not air-conditioned, uh, pukey gold color, but I liked it. And so I measured it, and so I went home and I drew a, with a piece of chalk on the garage floor where that truck would sit. And I told my kids, don't sit anything on this square. If I catch anything on the square, I'm taking it to the Goodwill. This is where my new truck goes. What new truck? The one I'm getting. When are you going to get it? Well, pretty quick. Well, I don't have the money for the truck. I got no money for gasoline for a truck. I'm broke. I mean, making minimum wage jobs. And so eight months later, I had a truck sitting there. He says, how'd you get that truck? I started believing God. Started thanking God. Father, thank you, God. So I'd make up a song. Got my first house uh, in uh, Blodgett, Missouri, south of Sison. And we would drive out and live in a little rent house. And, and so uh, we'd drive out where we got some land out there and bought a piece of land, two and a half acres, 12 miles outside of town. Every Sunday we'd drive out to it. And so it was on Blodgett Road, so I think I need to get something going. So I, I made up a song. I, uh, so I said, thank you, Lord, for my new home. Thank you, Lord, for my new home. Thank you, Lord, for my new home out on Blodgett Road. Oh, thank you, Lord, for my new home. Drove my wife nuts. I'd sing it all the time. I didn't have a second verse. Just had one verse. Thank you, Lord, for my new home. Don't get another. No, I like it. Thank you, Lord, for my new home out on Blodgett Road. Well, two years later, I had a brand new house sitting out there. You get what you say. It's in the Bible. She said, you have not because you ask not. You've got to get your mouth to line up with God's word. Not what you see. It's a faith thing. Because once you get it, you don't need faith. Once I got my house, I didn't need faith for the house. I got the house. Once I got the truck, I don't need faith for the truck. I got the truck. I'm using faith for something I don't have. I'm using faith all the time for things I don't have, not for things I do have. You got to start with uh, your marriage, you know. Thank you, Lord, for a loving spouse. I'm, I've been married five years now. I say it all the time. My wife's going to suck the lips off my face. I'm very serious. And I say it all the time. That woman's going to suck the lips off my face. I don't care how bald and fat I get. That woman's going to suck the lips off my face. That woman loves me. And so I pray to our Father, I thank you for the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. We're a marriage of laughter and we're a marriage of love. And I say it and I pray it and I sing it. And then she just giggles now. Because I say it all the time. And she kisses all the time. She kisses real good. <laughs> Whoa. That's all I got to say about that. Um, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. What's faith? I'm talking about something I don't see yet. But I'm talking it. I'm saying it. Well, I love your pastor. He's lived this his whole life. He is what this said. Now, I love your pastor for a lot of reasons, but I love him mostly because of what he does. He believes the Word of God. And he's got challenges like everybody else. We all go through challenges, but he knows how to overcome them. So he doesn't slow down. And so you've got to have somebody. You've got to chase somebody that's running faster than you. 
That was deep. Somebody got that. Number five, number five, resist the devil, he will flee. Well, this is foreign to most people. They don't know how to do that. Well, well how do you do that? Well, you've got to speak God's word. James 4, 7. James 4, 7. Humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What do you resist him with? The work of God. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to say what God says. I'm the head and not the tail above and not beneath everything I said, Andrew Prophet. I remember when I got laid off twice. You got, well, I believe I'm surrounded by the shield of divine favor. People like me, they don't know why they like me. People like me. And they said, well, nobody's hiring. Well, they're going to hire me. Nobody's getting a raise. They're going to give me a raise. And so you just got to get that thing going. And I've shared the story about my daughter. She had an accounting degree, and she got a job at a bank. And they promised a great salary starting out, but they promised her a raise. For years, she didn't get a raise. And so I go to her house one day. She's crying. I said, what's wrong with you? They promised me a raise. And they're not going to give me one. And I'm going to quit. Give me another job. I said, where are you going to work? Nobody's hiring right now. You know, it was the early 80s. Nobody's hiring. Who, who are you going to go to work for? And she didn't know. And so I just got mad. I said, okay, well, let's get an agreement. Then I'll pray with you. I'm your preacher daddy. And so we bowed our heads in our living room. So, Father, we set ourselves in agreement between Matthew 18, 19. Many people down at that bank will get raises. Jessica's not going to get one. And I bind the devil and I plead the blood. Many people at that bank will get raises. Eventually, she'll not get a raise. Dad, what are you saying? Honey, I'm saying what you say. You say you'll never get a raise. I agree with you. I want what you want. You say you'll never get a raise. You'll never. I plead the blood of Jesus. You'll never get a raise. Dad, don't say that. Well, then you don't say that. Shut your mouth up. Well, eight months later in December, she was voted employee of the year. And they doubled her salary. God watches over his word to perform it. You got to give God something to work with. It's a very simple gospel. Jesus said eight times in your testament, you have not because you ask not. Ask that you joy might be made full. Now this is the last, this is the sixth, and this is the good one. We're going back in the Old Testament. Uh, you got to learn how to listen more than you talk. Two ears, one mouth. Two ears, one mouth. It's a math thing. So this is real good. This is 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. God's talking to Elijah. Elijah's been running from Jezebel, running for his life. You know, he called fire to heaven and great miracles, but then he's running. He all of a sudden, he turned tail and he ran. So God speaks to him. He's running way outside the country, hiding in a cave. God speaks to him. Go outside and stand before me on the mountain. As Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. Hmm. And Elijah heard it. He wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. And the voice said, what are you doing out here, Elijah? Now, I can give you a ton of scriptures on that, but God never yells. God never yells. Humans yell. What are you doing? Man, that's stupid. God never yells. God always speaks in a still, small, quiet voice. You have to get quiet to hear God. You got to get quiet. You got to learn how to shut your own mouth. Well, that makes people nervous. You go shut your mouth, you go crazy. I mean, the first time I tried it, well, go in your closet and pray. Well, I went in my closet, turned out the light, and I sat down on the floor. My mom went to running like, like a laser beam. Pew, 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 pew. I'm thinking about, oh, man, I should have brought a pad. There's, I'm thinking of things I need to do and I should have done, I got to do. And, and my mom went nuts. I think, you can't get quiet. The devil shows up. I said, no, you got to learn to get quiet. Get quiet. Now, men can do this easier than women because, ladies, we can shut our brain down. Men cannot think. My wife says, <laughs> oh, I said so many times, Joe, what are you thinking? I said, what? What are you thinking? Nothing. Well, you've got to be thinking something. No. Men can think nothing, ladies. It's a medical fact. Men can think nothing. What are you thinking? Nothing. We can empty our brain. <laughs> yeah, women, you don't believe that because you can't do that. A woman's brain's running all the time, like popcorn on a hot grill. Pop, 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 pop. But men can do that. We can just shut ourselves down. And so I remember one time my wife said, well, you can't be thinking that. Well, I am. Well, you look worried. What? You look worried. Are you worried? No. You sure? You look worried. I do. Maybe I am. I didn't think I was. 
I mean, and she taught me into worrying in about 10 minutes. That's not even funny. You've got to learn how to get still. Now, maybe you can do that washing dishes. Maybe you can do that when you're sitting on the toilet. Maybe you can do that when you're mowing grass. Find some place where you can get quiet. Now, uh, we own two and a half acres, and I, I got a great riding lawnmower. It was used. I'd rebuild it. And so I'd mow the grass when it didn't mean mowing. And so my wife went, what are you doing? I'm mowing grass. She knew what I meant. What are you doing? Well, when I'm riding the mower, nobody can talk to me. Can't hear a cell phone. Not don't have a cell phone. I can't hear the radio, TV. I love it. I just love it. I feel the hum and and I just my mind just goes neutral. And I mow up two and a half acres. Now I mow it. That's it. Didn't even need mowing. What are you doing? She knows what I'm doing. I'm listening to God. You get still and you get quiet. You'll hear a voice, and it's usually something short and simple. And I remember every now I'd get a thought, and I'd just come back. Shut the mower off. We didn't finish mowing. I got what I needed. I heard God's voice. I'll, I just need a word. You know, Peter was drowning in the water. He's, he, he's going, I mean, he's on the boat. And, uh, the storm comes. All the disciples think they're drowning. Jesus comes walking on the water. Light and straight. Ba-boom. Oh, that's Jesus. And so Peter says, Lord, is that you? <laughs> yeah. He says, well, that you asked me to come out there. And so, well, come on. So he crawls over the edge, but in the middle of a storm, the waves are crashing, the lightning is flashing. He starts walking on the water. Woo! Yeah. And the other 11 watch, oh my goodness, he's walking on the water like the Lord is. Well, he gets about halfway out, and he gets to notice, man, those waves kind of tall. So he gets his eyes off the Lord and on the waves. And all of a sudden, he starts to sink. He sinks like a rock. All of a sudden, he's gurgling. And the Bible says he prayed the shortest prayer in the Bible Help. Help. And Jesus helped him and picked him up. And the first thing Jesus says, why don't you doubt? You know, you ever talk to, you ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Jesus criticizes the disciples a lot. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. Jesus, the Son of God who created the universe, expects us to be able to use our faith. Well, faith speaks. It says something. So you've got to get your mouth moving. So I tell my kids every year, get a list. If I'm in a conversation, I go through these six things. Let me just let me show. I got a I got a short list here. Um, yeah, here's the one. <laughs> then when I do the five minute conversation, this is what I read to them. Okay, guys, you got to constantly push the negative out of your mind because it's coming at you all the time. Old things have passed away. All things become new. Slide us looking back to impede your progress. Don't look back. Don't talk about. Well, I should have. I could have. I get and they could have and they ought and they should have. Don't. Get out of the past. The devil's in your past. God's in your future. Stay out of your past. Don't go to your past. The greatest days are tomorrow, not yesterday. Ooh, that's good. I am clean. I forgive as I'm forgiven. Well, I'm forgiving everything. So I forgive everything. You don't have to ask to forgive you. I forgive you, you little knothead. God bless you. Faith has a beginning and an end. It's called fight the good fight of faith. It's a fight to believe God. Because you get a scripture in you, I'm going to get these three scriptures, and I'm going to quote them for three days. The fourth day, I don't even remember what the scriptures are. Where are they at? I forgot what they are. What was Adam's quoting? And you have to write it down and read it and write it down and read it. And it works. Resist the devil and he'll flee. Then I heard, learn how to listen more than you talk. And so I make conversation on the phone. I tell the kids, now I can't come to your house and make you do this. But we'll talk next Christmas, next year. You tell me what you believe in God for. So in those earliest, we still got together as a, physically as a family. I'd make it well, last year you said you were believing God for this. That's what you told me last December. It's now this December. What happened? What? Well, last December, you wrote on this piece of paper that you gave me, you're going to believe God for this. Believe God for a raise. Did you get a raise? No. What happened? I don't know. They didn't give me one. Nobody's going to give me nothing, baby. You've got to believe God for it. And so other kids say, well, I got a raise. I got a new job. And then there's sibling rivalry and jealousy. Well, you're just lucky. No, there's no such thing as luck. There's no bad luck. There's no good luck. There's God and the devil. We're in between like an Oreo cookie. We choose every day what we're going to do. We choose who we're going to serve. And so you got to get a habit of what we're going to do. I think I'll think about God. So I keep it real simple. So guys, every morning you wake up, 
get out of bed. Smith Wigglesworth told this story for years before he passed away. He said, every morning I'd get up. First Saturday when I hit the floor, I would dance before God the first five minutes every morning. With all the morning breath I could muster, I'd dance before God the first five minutes of every morning. I start thanking God. Now, I don't dance that much anymore, but I do thank God. I open my mouth. When I wake up, my eyes open up. First thing I'll do, drives Angel nuts. She's kind of used to it. I start thanking God. She says, who are you talking to? I'm talking to God. I'm just thanking him. This is the day he has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad. He's going to order my steps, direct my path. I'm surrounded by divine favor. This will be the greatest day of my life. This is going to be the greatest day of my life. And I get my mouth moving. Well, when you start saying what God says, angels get up and stop reading magazines, and they get busy watching over the Word of God. Angels, there's so many you can't count them, they're innumerable. Angels bring the Word of God to pass, but they can't do what you don't say. And so every day you get up, first thing you think about, start quoting some scripture. This is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad. It's going to be the greatest job I've ever had. Well, it's Tuesday. It's going to be the best Tuesday I've ever had. Well, it's Thursday. It's going to be the best Thursday I've ever had. It's going to be the best week. This will be the best year I've ever had. I say it every year. And we've gone from faith to faith and glory to glory. When I got on the plane, I met an old friend in Tampa. I got on the plane yesterday. Uh, he was asking, do you still travel? I said, yes. Really? Yeah. And people invite you? Yeah. That's why I still travel. I don't go where I don't get invited. Really? Yeah. Well, why? Well, family's still a hot issue because most of the people, um, there were 27 national ministries that traveled and did what I did when I started 30 years ago. None of them are in existence today. They've all quit or retired or stopped. But I didn't. Now, you know how you move to the head of the line? You don't get out of line. It's real deep. I'm still in line. Now, we're trying to change things how we do. We do things a little different. We've got podcasts. And, uh, pastors help me with a lot of stuff. Uh, we got great podcasts, and we're on the uh, web three times a week. We've got a recording studio. We do a lot of stuff. I still travel, though. Uh, I think I was in 48 churches last year. I'm gonna be in a, uh, we got scheduled to be in 50 this year. And so people still invite us. Now, all of a sudden, they'll hit a gap where it's like, we stay booked for a year. Well, now we're booked for about three months out, solid. But we have potential. I will share with the pastor. You know, my wife, she's so different because you marry your opposite. So down the airport, 5 o'clock in the morning yesterday, and she said, Joe, you know, we got a month completely open. No, baby, it'll be fine. Well, how are you going to feel it? Well, it'll come. You can't make somebody invite you. You can't force somebody to invite you. Hey, we're hurting. Can you invite us? Write us a check. <laughs> no, no, there are people that need me. I don't want the people that don't need me. I want the people that need me. Not everybody needs me. Not everybody likes to listen to me. But there's some people that need me and they like listening to me. They'll call. And so, by the time I landed in Chattanooga, I had filled up two weekends in April on a Saturday uh, on the phone because everybody got cell phone now. And it's like, and so Angel said, Oh, that's amazing. No, it's not. It's God. It's what I was called to do. If God called you, he'll equip you, and he'll fill it up. And so you gotta, you, gotta, you can't be God. So I, I just got one last thing I want to share. You're not God. God's God. The way you get God in your life is by thanking him. The way you get God to move is by thanking him. So whatever you need, you need to start thanking in advance. You've got to thank him before you see it. God inhabits praise. Father, I thank you. it will be the greatest year we've ever had. Thank you. I'm going to hire the best employee I've ever had. I thank you. And uh, we've been through a process that we got. Uh, I should have had a book table here, but I hired, hired this one great kid. He's so good. He's so good. But he married a Brazilian girl who didn't speak English. So he had learned to speak Portuguese. And so he's pretty good at it now. She's speaking pretty good English. Well, she's been to my office half a dozen times. And she's helping us with our web because she's real smart on computers. And I can't understand her. I have to get him to turn. What Here, tell her I need this. And see what she says. And so the uh, first two weeks, they were gone on a mission trip to Thailand. Where? Thailand. I don't think that's a good place to go. No, it's not. It's a nasty place. 
Well, they feel called to go to nasty places. Now, they weren't for me, but I'm not going to no nasty place. I don't like leaving America. I like America. God bless America. You know, coast to coast, border to border, but that's it. I've been overseas three times. I don't like going. I have no grace for it. But I have staff that have grace for it. And so I told them, there's no book table because my book table people are in Thailand. But they're coming back. So I'll bring it next year when I come back. And so there's always amending, repairing, adjusting, even in your own family, in your own marriage. Kids don't stay two forever. They turn 12. They don't stay 12 forever. They turn 20 and 30, and they start dropping their own babies. It's called the process of life, and it's a wonderful thing. So enjoy the journey and quit gripe about every change. Every time someone says, well, what in the world? Well, dear God, well, no, that, that, that's not good. You've got to learn to stay thankful. Father, I thank you. I don't know what's going on, but it's going to work out for my good. I don't know what's going on, Father, but I thank you. This day's going to be better than yesterday. I'm not sure what's happening, Father. This week's going to be the best week I've ever had. God goes where he gets thanks. So this year, 2023, be a good year to start being thankful. To get your mouth moving in the right direction. Amen? Let's stand up. Bow your heads. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word that sets us free and keeps us free. Father, we declare that this is going to be our greatest year ever. You said you would take us from faith to faith and glory to glory. So we are the redeemed of the Lord, and we're going to say so. We are redeemed from the curse, which was poverty, sickness, and death. We're blessed and highly favored. We're surrounded with a shield of divine favor. And that is our confession for this year, Father. Lord, put us in the middle of your will. Whatever your will is for our life, our family, our business, put us in the middle of your will. Prosper everything we set our hand to. Father, we look forward to a great adventure. In Jesus' name, and everybody said,